Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I am Lori Wallach. I direct the Rethink Trade Program at the American Economic Liberties Project. We are about to embark on a speedy guided tour of the Investor State Dispute Settlement System, ISDS, and why and how countries in the Americas ought to exit this ISDS regime. In the name of getting everyone up to speed on this same page, and with apologies to all of the ISDS mavens who are with us, let me just quickly unpack what investor state dispute settlements is. ISDS grants foreign investors and corporations new substantive rights and privileges, often including rights that aren't available in domestic law, and empowers them to sue governments outside of government's domestic court systems, but in front of tribunals of three private sector attorneys who serve on these ad hoc tribunals. And these lawyers can award the corporations unlimited sums to be paid in compensation. All that the, the foreign corporations have to do is convince the lawyers that an environmental law or a safety regulation violates their special investor rights granted in what are now hundreds of ISDS enforced agreements. These ad hoc tribunals are not subject to outside appeal. A lot of the tribunalists rotate between suing governments for corporations and deciding cases. So very strong structural conflict of interest. And there is no limit on the amount of compensation to be paid by a country's taxpayers that they can order be paid over to corporations when policies change, when democracy happens. As you're gonna hear, the results of this system of ISDS have been extremely damaging. And not surprisingly, a variety of countries are starting to exit this ISDS regime, which was one of the tools of the height of hyper-globalization, of neoliberalism. So next week provides an excellent opportunity for countries in the Americas to do a unified, to launch a unified exit from the IS regime. And the reason why is on November 3rd, President Biden is hosting a summit of the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, APEP. It's an initiative that involves 12 countries in the Americas. Those countries are Barbados, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama, Peru, Uruguay, and the United States. And the APEP's purpose, the idea of this get together, is to pursue inclusive human rights-based approach to economic policy, to address climate change, mitigation, adapt adaptation, resilience, and promote clean energy alternatives, to improve access to health and public services, and to encourage private sector investment that meets environmental, social, and governance criteria. So to fulfill that vision and those goals, the participating countries must dismantle ISDS. And across the Americas, there's actually a growing interest in doing so. So given the APAP provides such an auspicious opportunity, Rethink Trade joined forces with the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment and Georgetown Law's Center for the Advancement of the Rule of Law in, the, in Latin America and the Center on Inclusive Trade and Development to create a detailed roadmap for the international and domestic legal pathways that can deliver an ISDS exit for the Americas. There are some tricky legal questions you're gonna hear. Give, um, given that we have one hour together, we're gonna to start with a fireside chat style discussion with Professor Joe Stiglitz, we're going to have the authors unpack a little bit of what's in the report and what the answers are to these mysterious questions. And then we'll have a closing from Senator Elizabeth Warren. So with no further ado, to set the context and get us started, Professor Alvaro Santos from Georgetown Law School will engage Professor Joe Stiglitz in a fireside chat, minus the fire. <laughs> Among Joe Stiglitz's many roles is university professor at Columbia. He won the Nobel Prize in economics and the John Bates 
Clark Metal. He is a former vice president and chief economist of the World Bank. He has had numerous other roles and contributions through his scholarship and advocacy. Professor Santos is the professor of law and faculty director at the Center for the Advancement of Rule of Law in the Americas, Corolla, at Georgetown Law Center. He teaches and writes in the areas of international trade, economic development, transnational labor law, drug policy, and in 19, in, sorry, in 2018, he served as the deputy chief negotiator of the USMCA for the newly elected, then newly elected AMLO government in Mexico. Professor Santos, if I can ask you to start, and thank you both Professor Santos and Professor Stiglitz, please. Thank you so much, uh, Laurie, and good morning to everyone. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, it's really an honor and a pleasure to have you join us today in the launch of this white paper. Uh, let me jump right into it. Starting in the early 90s, uh, many countries in the Americas, and in fact in the world, uh, went on an investment agreement signing spree. Just among the 12 countries that have agreed to participate in this Biden administration's initiative, the APEP, uh, there are 43 investment agreements in force. And today, after many ISDS attacks on countries' environmental, health, or other public interest policies, it seem, seems hard to believe that countries granted multinational corporations these special rights and the power to sue sovereign governments before arbitral tribunals to abstain these staggering sums of money in awards. You've written a lot about uh, ISDS and share your perspective. So I, I wanted us to start with your view about uh, why uh, countries sign on to all of these agreements. What were the promised benefits of ISDS that led countries to be so active in uh, signing these agreements? Oh, first, let me uh, uh, say what a pleasure it is to be here to discuss uh, an issue that I've been engaged in for a very long time. I think uh, to understand why they signed uh, these agreements, I would begin by saying that they were under very aggressive uh, pressure from the advanced countries. Um, and those advanced countries were essentially doing the bidding of uh their big firms, um, and European countries uh, uh, have these agreements with the, their former uh, colonies in Asia and Africa. Uh, they saw that as a way to protect their colonial era business interests. But the United States uh, had these agreements with uh, uh, the many, many countries that we began to invest in. What we said to the developing countries, what we promised, was that it would bring uh, more foreign investment. Uh, it was, uh, in that sense, a key development tool. Um, and uh, bringing more investment would uh, increase their incomes and help uh, move up them out of the poverty. Um, the uh, essential issue that... Uh, was of concern at that moment of time uh, many years ago was, or at least that was mentioned, uh, was the problem of expropriation where the governments take over the assets. Uh, but there have been very few expropriations and the U.S. government and the World Bank provide insurance against, uh, against expropriation. Um, the agenda uh, was actually much broader and much, I think, more invidious. Um, the uh, and particularly uh, uh, one of the interesting aspects is that the U.S. never considered the threats that these agreements could pose to its own domestic policies. It only saw them as a way to lock in favorable treatment for U.S. multinationals abroad. Uh, the uh, we know today, though, that these ISDS expand uh, far beyond the scope of compensation for actual expropriation uh, and uh, both in terms of the amount of money and the circumstances. Um, it extended to what was called regulatory takings. Uh, regulatory takings is whenever you pass a regulation, 
that affects the value of an asset, uh, it can't. It, it is referred to as a regulatory taking. The notion that firms should be compensated for that has been rejected by uh, every branch of the U.S. government. Uh, I was in the Clinton administration where we fought uh, strongly against those that wanted that kind of compensation. Congress supported us and the courts have supported us. Uh, But uh, that was where the concept uh, really started. Uh, The interesting thing is that uh, this... uh, the ISDS provision in NAFTA, Chapter 11, was never discussed. I was in the Clinton administration when uh, NAFTA was ratified. Uh, we never had a meeting about uh, the implications of Chapter 11 for the United States. Uh, in fact, if we had uh, really had a discussion, it would never have been accepted because we were fighting a battle against regulatory takings. It was simply not realized that it gave all the rights to foreign investors and all the liability and responsibility to domestic governments. So let me pick up on something that you said, which is uh, what countries believed that ISDS could do, whether it was pressured or imposed by rich countries or self-willingly adopted by developing countries, this powerful idea that it was a development tool that ISDS could bring foreign direct investment. Uh, So after 30 years uh, of this regime, um, have those expectations been achieved? What's your assessment? The the short answer is no. Uh, The promise of ISDS was that FDI, foreign direct investment, would flood in, didn't materialize. Uh, There are econometric studies showing there's no evidence, strong uh, evidence on that. There are case studies that reinforce the econometrics. Uh, Countries that had numerous ISDS agreements did not get uh, more FDI than those who didn't. Uh, Same thing if you look across sectors. Uh, Countries like Brazil had study FDI, didn't sign these kinds of agreements for good reason. Uh, countries that pulled out of ISDS uh, agreements uh, didn't uh, suffer. Um, and uh, the ISDS may be particularly irrelevant uh, uh, in an a- a- age of nearshoring and supply chain re- regionalization, irrelevant for the purpose of attracting investment, but uh, very relevant uh, for uh, what it does for what countries can do, for instance, for responding to climate change. Um, Thank you. One of the, well, I, w- I was going to say, uh, while it didn't bring in more investment, the range of uh, uh, consequences of these uh, which were, as I said before, were not realized in 1992-94 when uh, NAFTA began, uh, uh, has just expanded uh, enormously. Uh, not a surprise. Uh, Laurie talked about the uh, inadequacies of the dispute resolution process uh, uh, in the hands of uh, lawyers who are paid by the corporations um they've taken advantage of that to uh force cu- countries to pay enormous amounts far greater than the investment that they put in uh they have to be compensated for the loss of investor uh, return expectations uh which is a totally made up concept um and so uh, what we're seeing is that uh, ISDS suits are, are not about, uh, for the most part, not about expropriation. Uh, they're about uh, a range of things that go to uh, environmental regulation, public health measures, financial stability rules, green energy and climate policies, taxes, uh, uh, anything that can go into cut into corporate profits. They can challenge labor laws like minimum wages. Anything that affects profits can be a subject to suit, which means almost everything. 
And let me just emphasize uh, something, the asymmetry. If government does something that enhances profits from what was expected when it, uh, uh, the firm entered, there's no way of government recovering. Um, and the amounts are very, very large. For instance, Italy had to pay $200 million to a British corporation for its decision to ban offshore oil drilling as part of its climate agenda. A Canadian company is seeking $15 billion of U.S. taxpayer money after President Obama declined to issue a permit for the construction of the transcontinental tar sands uh, uh, pipeline, which is called the XL pipeline. So ultimately, ISDS has become a powerful, secretive, and very expansive regime that has been weaponized to cut, uh, to put corporate profits over public interest policies here and around the world. So l let me um, ask you this. For the reasons that you just, you just stated, many developing countries have begun to leave the regime, have exited uh, with different degrees of success. But what we're seeing now is that rich countries uh, have also started to move in a different direction. Uh, and the U new a USMCA is a good example of that, where Canada and the U.S. eliminated their ISDS agreement and the U.S. and Mexico drastically reduced it. Do you think that this offers an opportunity, and particularly in the context of APEP, the American par America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, is this uh, something that could help developing countries who are interested in, in doing this to do that? Uh, what would you uh, suggest? Oh, I think this is uh, a really important point. Uh, uh, the, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, when uh, NAFTA was uh, passed, for instance, which was a very big uh, uh, provision uh, of ISDS Chapter 11 of that agreement, uh, there was no one that thought U.S. would be sued. Um, the U.S., when it, uh, under Trump, exited uh, uh, NAFTA and uh, created a new agreement with Mexico and uh, 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 Canada, uh, it didn't include Chapter 11 uh, because it was beginning to be understood how invidious it was. Um, Germany's had to pay large amounts uh, over its energy policy. Um, now, ISDS is being viewed as one of the biggest threats to strong climate action. Uh, in fact, <laughs> the numbers are amazing. Uh, a recent study concluded that if countries are to fulfill their commitments under the Paris Agreement, which doesn't go far enough, they may be liable to oil and gas corporations for $340 billion in future ISDS cases. Um, so, uh, let me come to the, the main issue that we have today, and you mentioned it in terms of the discussion of the American Partnership for Economic Prosperity. Uh, the problems we've been discussing have been apparent for years. I've been writing about them. Lori's been writing about them for years. Uh, what makes these issues especially relevant now is that President Biden has launched uh, this uh, American Partnership for Economic Prosperity, um, and it, it, one of the main themes is fighting climate disaster and economic inequality, improving public health, strengthening democracy. To achieve any of these goals, ISDS has to go. It is a direct hindrance. The U.S. can be a key leader in this uh, reform agenda, especially since the United States plays such an outsized role in getting its neighbors into the ISDS mess with the U.S., free trade agreements and the bilateral investment agreements, it, it would be a great time to strengthen regional relationships to have the United States lead an America's wide ISDX exit. Now, let me just uh, make one final point. Launching uh, this as a group exit would be very helpful in protecting our neighbors from one of the factors that leads some countries not to exit. That is the fear, not grounded actually with much evidence, but still it's a fear 
that investors will see an individual country leaving the system as a signal of some sort uh, that they don't have, a, they're not committed to the private sector uh, and to good investment. When a block of countries exit together, there is safety in numbers. I think that's a very good note note to finish on. Professor Stiglitz, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your perspective. Well, thank you. Let me now uh, turn to Daniel Rangel, who's going to start us with the presentation of the white paper. Uh, Daniel is the research director of Rethink Trade, and we're very proud of your stand to count him as our alum. Uh, so, Daniel. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh... And thank you, Professor Stiglitz, for joining us and helping us setting the stage for this presentation of the white paper that we think that is very important right now. I had the pleasure to work alongside Alvaro and my other co-authors in this paper, uh, and I'm going to be bringing them in to give a walkthrough of the reasons why it's so important to promote ISDS uh, to promote an ISDS exit through the APEP process and give some of ideas of how to actually do it. So the first thing that we did in this project is try to map out the extent of the problem. And in order to do so, we collaborated with the Corolla team that has developed very comprehensive databases, both on the investment agreements and the ISDS disputes that are related to Latin America. Then we adapted them to cover the APEP countries. And we got that number that Alvaro mentioned. Just among themselves, APEP countries have signed 47 BATs and FTAs with an ISDS clause, with 43 of them still in force. Those are the links that you are seeing in this graphic. Uh, and as you can see, many pair of countries have more than one agreement with ISDS in force among them. For instance, Peru and Mexico, or Canada and Peru. And this is because they have they maybe have an FTA, but also a VAT. And this is, speaks to the need to have some kind of systemic fix that would allow us to deal with multiple agreements at the same time. Having identified the universe of agreements that could be fixed through an APEP ISDS exit, we explored the country, this country's experience with ISDS. And as you can imagine, the experience has not been a good one. ISDS is a costly and ineffective system of failed promises. APEP countries have been on the receiving end of 231 ISDS claims. That is 18% of all cases worldwide, which is a disproportionate number of, of cases considering the population of the countries that are involved. They have already been ordered to pay it or agreed to pay it in settlements extracted by corporations at some equivalent to $2.7 billion. What is more concerning is that there are 73 pending disputes. And in those disputes, investors are seeking close to $47 billion in compensation. So to put that number into perspective, $47 billion is equivalent to 17 times Ecuador's entire national health budget for 2021. It's equal to half of Colombia's current national budget and is equivalent to 13% of the Inflation Reduction Act's budget that was authorized by the U.S. Congress last year for the entire next decade. Of course, these exorbitant demands affect the fiscal stability of a country. ISDS claims represent a contingent liability for governments that affect their capacity to carry out investments or spend in public procurement. For instance, Colombia received its first ISDS claim in 2016. Three additional corporations filed claims that year. The total value that they were asking for was $19 billion. That figure was nearly half of the Colombian government's spending on goods and services for that same year. So in that year, the Colombian government was put in a position of having to decide on whether to reduce the procurement of goods like medicines and school supplies or do investments and plan ahead for potential ISDS losses or don't reduce it and risk future financial stability. And the issue is that the odds of winning these cases are actually not good. APEP countries have prevailed 
on the merits on less than one third of the ISDS cases that they have faced. Corporations have won ISDS disputes or extracted settlements in 42% of the cases. And one, and one quarter of the cases have ended with a, with a tribunal's ruling the, dismissing the case for jurisdictional issues, such as the investor couldn't prove that they actually had done an investment in the country that they were challenging, or cases in which you have an ultra wealthy individual that sees in having more than one passport to sue their own home country. And I think that the most important finding that we had in our report what is shown in this graphic. Because this graphic shows the claims, the rules that investors include in their ISDS complaints against APEP countries. And as you can see here, investors have invoked fair and equitable treatment twice as much as national treatment that basically non-discrimination obligations in their cases against APEP countries. So fair and equitable treatment is a very elastic standard that among other things has been interpreted to protect legitimate expectations of an investor which basically means banning countries from making regulatory changes that could affect those expectations. Similarly, investors have filed more indirect expropriation claims. Those are the regulatory takings that Professor Stiglitz was mentioned. They have been filing. They have filed five times more of those claims than direct expropriation cases. So that shows that investors rarely resort to ISDS to get compensation for government takings or expropriations, but it's much more about using this kind of big open-ended protections like fair and equitable treatment or, reg or bans against regulatory takings to challenge environmental regulations, financial stability measures, and public health policies. And I think that this is the perfect transition for me to bring Mario Sorio into the conversation. Mario is a senior fellow at Georgetown Center on Inclusive Trade and Development. And I would like for Mario to give us a little bit more background on some of these challenges and some of the more outlandish cases that we have studied, and also how we have been seeing that some countries are starting to exit in the system. I'm sorry, I was muted there, but thank you, Daniel, and, and greetings to everyone joining us online. The numbers Daniel shared regarding the Americas' experience with ISDS are impactful, illustrating the adverse consequences of ISDS enforced agreements in the region, particularly for APEP nations. The ISDS regime has routinely led to large awards that place significant financial burdens on governments in the region. ISDS has seldom been used to claim protection from the kind of outright expropriation or gross denial of justice that the system ostensibly was set up to check, as Professor Stiglitz explained. Instead, as Danielle mentioned, its users often rely on vaguely worded and broad provisions found in investment agreements, such as those on fair and equitable treatment or indirect expropriation. As evidenced by the studies and cases outlined in our white paper, the ISDS regime grants powerful corporations and wealthy individuals the power to challenge democratic public policies enacted in the public interest. There are many instances where the ISDS regime has been used against democratically enacted policies in the Americas and all over the world. And I encourage everyone to read our comprehensive report for a more, more thorough review. For my brief intervention today, I will focus only on a couple of examples pertaining to environmental protection in the Americas, given the urgency of the climate crisis and the significance of transitioning to green energy for humanity and our planet. My first example concerns Echo Oro, formerly known as Graystar, a Canadian mining company that in 2016 initiated an investor state dispute against Colombia following the Colombian Constitutional Court's decision to give full effect to a democratic law prohibiting mining operations in rare, high-altitude wetlands, which account for over 70% of Colombia's drinking water. The measures at issue in that case impacted a proposed gold mine that the Canadian corporation was developing, even though Ecuador had not received all the permits required to begin extracting gold. 
the company won its ISDS case under the Colombia Canada FDA, despite the Colombian Constitutional Court's determination that the mine would have breached Colombian law, and despite an environmental exception provision included in the FDA justifying the measures adopted by the Colombian authorities to protect the wetlands system. My second example, touched upon by Professor Stiglitz, involves the Keystone XL project, the proposed pipeline designed to transport crude oil from Alberta, Canada, through more than a thousand U.S. rivers, streams, lakes, and wetlands, ultimately reaching the Gulf Coast. The project encountered strong opposition from indigenous communities, farmers, and ranchers residing in or near the pipeline's path, along with environmental and health experts and organizations. The, these challenges prompted the Obama administration to deny PC Energy, then TransCanada, a prominent North American energy infrastructure operator, the permit to construct the pipeline. Although this move cost PC Energy to initiate an ISDS case, President Trump's election led to the project's advancement with the permit issued and the case dropped. However, on his first day in office, President Biden revoked the permit, citing inconsistency with the administration's climate imperatives. Consequently, DC Energy abandoned the project and reinstated its ISDS claims. These illustrations underscore the ISDS bias against democratic decision making, which frequently involves independent action across branches of government and political bargaining. They also reinforce Danielle's earlier point about the staggering scale of the claims, with the Colombian case amounting to 700 million and the Keystone example to 15 billion representing the largest claim made to date over measures implemented to combat the climate crisis and reduce reliance on fossil fuels in the region. In response to a much longer list of examples of corporate attacks to democratic measures, encompassing not only climate action, but also health regulation and many other policies taken in the public interest, countries have begun to withdraw from the ISDS regime. A global pullback from ISDS is gaining momentum. In the region, Ecuador and Bolivia have abandoned the system, while the U.S., Canada, and Mexico have effectuated their own unique ISDX exit in the context of the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. Numerous other countries have taken steps to pull out from ISDS. Outside the America, South Africa took the lead, followed by Indonesia, India, Australia, New Zealand, and more recently, Pakistan which inaugurated the ISDS system by entering into the first investment agreement with Germany in 1959. EU member states have agreed to end ISDS among themselves following a ruling by the European Court of Justice. Furthermore, many European states have also begun to withdraw from the Energy Charter Treaty, the agreement that corporations most frequently turn to initiate invest investor state disputes globally. A series of costly awards impacting policies designed to safeguard the environment and advance a green energy transition, coupled with concerns that corporations would persist in using the treaty to undermine ambitious climate action, have triggered this mass exodus. So the, the message of our white paper is clear. These actions by countries highlight a growing global trend concerning ISDS and emphasize the need for a form of hemispheric economic cooperation that aligns more closely with APEP's objectives of promoting sustainable and inclusive growth and fostering the development of new and improved tools rather than obstacles to address the challenges confronting countries today and in the years ahead. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you, Mario. And I think that the case has been made of why we need an ISDS exit in the Americas. And actually, we know now that a lot of countries are already doing so. Before going to our next, next speaker, I just want to remind everyone that we're taking questions so you can drop them in the chat function where you are getting this stream. And now I would like to bring in Ladan Meranvar, who is the senior legal researcher at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, CCSI. Ladan, we need an exit. What are the paths under international economic, international economic law to do this exit? Thank you so much, Daniel, um, Mario, and Professor Stiglitz, and um, Alvaro, all of you. Thank you. Um, so as you've heard, this is really a crucial moment in international investment policy making. Um, in my opinion, two factors have really converged, calling for a new direction in this space. 
The first is, uh, is, is that it has become increasingly difficult to justify the ISDS mechanism given the cost, as we've heard. Um, and these include, among other factors, its undermining of the role of domestic institutions and courts, the loss of policy space for governments, especially at a time when we're trying to uh, move forward with the energy uh, transition, the financial risks associated with litigation and liability, regulatory chill, et cetera, et cetera. And while concerns about the system have been rising over the past decade or so, um, there's still no conclusive evidence that ISDS necessarily leads to investment attraction or improved investment outcomes, as Professor Stiglitz pointed out. So it's hard to suffer the cost without really being able to demonstrate the benefits. And for this reason, some governments, as you just heard, um, even those that have been among the strongest proponents of ISDS are now changing course. The second factor is that there's a greater awareness of the need to design and implement more effective and efficient policies that will not only maximize the quantity of sustainable investments, but also align them with the country's overarching national and global development goals. So to the extent that countries don't think that their existing investment treaties uh, support their national goal goals or that their benefits, if any, are uh, worth their costs, those countries may want to clear the slates, essentially clear the path to create instruments that do meet their and their stakeholders' needs. So in our white paper, we explore three options that are available for governments that would like to free themselves uh, from the ongoing liability and policy constraints of their existing investment agreements. We also want to be clear, um, and again, Professor Stiglitz pointed this out, that for a government that's reconsidering its investment treaties and potentially terminating them, um, that does not mean that they are anti-investment, anti-foreigner, or anti-international law. Uh, instead, it reflects, or it should reflect, a responsible and reasonable decision um, that can be taken by conscientious governments seeking to govern effectively and fairly um, in a manner in a manner that aligns with their national goals, including efforts to mitigate uh, the climate crisis. So, in terms of the options available, uh, first there's the option to terminate bilateral investment treaties. Many countries have done so, um, including EU member states, among others, as Mario has already mentioned. The second option is that to amend free trade agreements by removing the investment chapter and the associated ISDS provision within them. Um, alternatively, governments can amend to remove only the ISDS provision within these agreements. And then last, treaty parties uh, can withdraw consent to ISDS arbitration from their BITs and FTAs. It's important to note, however, that while options one and, two and three are available to governments to exercise on a unilateral basis, there are risks and downfalls to doing it unilaterally. One is that unilateral termination of BITs will leave the survival clause in place for five to 20 years, depending on the treaty which means that that country will have exposure to ISDS claims for a number of years after it has terminated its agreement. Uh, there are a num number of countries that find themselves in this situation. Uh, in, the, in the Americas, we have Ecuador and Bolivia, but also there's India, uh, Italy, Indonesia, and so on. And with the unilateral withdrawal of consent to arbitrate option, the effectiveness is questionable because the tribunal may still take jurisdiction on the basis it finds that uh, that government's withdrawal is illegitimate. So instead, all three options can be done by mutual consent among contracting parties to, a, to an agreement, um, and that's preferable for the reasons why a unilateral approach really isn't. Um, there's no risk or downside to this approach. It's simply agreeing with your contracting par partner to terminate or amend an international agreement, which is allowed both under the Vienna Convention um, on the Law of Treaties and under the provisions of the relevant uh, investment agreements. In the case of mutual termination, uh, it's important that the survival clause be neutralized by explicit consent of the parties, which is again, within the right of the contracting uh, countries to do. And this was recently done in the termination agreement of the intra-EU BITs, where they also neutralized this, uh, the survival clause. And in the case of termination of consent, by consent, uh, it could be done with a replacement of a new treaty or without a replacement. And of course, the most salient example of the former is the renegotiated investment chapter in NAFTA, which is now the USMCA, 
um, and um, among other changes, ISDS was removed between the US and Canada. Now, in terms of how to implement these changes, governments can agree with their contracting partner to bilaterally terminate each of their BITs um, or to amend to remove the investment chapter of each of their FTAs by mutual consent. Or they can adopt a multilateral instrument that will allow each participating country, so in this case, the APEP countries, to indicate which of the three options outlined would, would apply to each of their uh, investment agreements. And if there is a match between the two contracting countries, then that option takes effect for that particular BIT or FTA. So in this way, countries can effectuate whatever changes they agree to for each of their agreements one by one. So I, I think that negotiating and adopting such a multilateral instrument uh, into the APEP framework would really enable an efficient way to deal with all the relevant BITs and FDAs among the APEP countries uh, through this consensual uh, process. Thank you. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you, Ladan. And now that we know the international legal pathways, I want to I want for Lori to bring us back home and she can explain to us how is this at all possible in the US considering it the political context and also the US legal system. Thank you very much, Danielle. And before diving into the legal question, I do want to set up the US political context, especially for our many international viewers. Um, first slide, please. So this is a quote from then candidate Joe Biden pledging not to include ISDS in his future agreements. And the question a lot of people ask me is, how the heck is it that a leading US presidential candidate could have this position in 2020 and related, why would it be entirely reasonable for APEP to be harnessed for an America's wide ISDS exit? I.e., why would it make sense for the United States to facilitate its neighbors getting out of the ISDS mess, given for decades the U.S. was pushing other countries in? Well, let me start with the ending, which is that um, President Biden wasn't an outlier in taking that no more ISDS position. So NAFTA's inclusion of ISDS began a spread of ISDS in the Americas and really an explosion of ISDS attacks, not just against developing countries' policies, but also against the US and Canada's policies. And there was a series of really outrageous NAFTA ISDS cases that got a lot of attention in the US which started to build awareness amongst the public of the threats, case after case after case. The thing is, basically, if you know what ISDS is and you know about the cases, you end up opposing it. So this is only a system that really has popularity when it's secret. And as U.S. opposition built, then the Obama administration tried to expand ISDS exponentially through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, these were two great big agreements that, frankly, opposition to ISDS was a major part in tanking. So by the time you get to the NAFTA renegotiations starting in 2017, there really was a pretty bipartisan congressional block of support for ending ISDS that was in NAFTA. And state and local officials and their trade associations, which were very Republican dominated, were calling for the end of ISDS, which gets us to Biden's position. So not doing more ISDS is great, but, you know, how the hell do we get out of it? Because we've already heard about the flood of ongoing cases. And, you know, the slide shows you those are pictures from TTIP, TPP, the NAFTA ISDS fight. So... Now, how do we get out of the remainder, the legacy ISDS? Well, for the US, it's a little tricky. If I can have the next slide, please. Because of the agreements, um, there are six that are that the US has ISDS with APEP countries that are free trade agreements, FTAs, and the other ones are BITS, bilateral investment treaties. So the FTAs are what are called congressional executive agreements, both bodies in Congress pass them by simple majority. The bits are treaty treaties, the Senate supermajority vote. So the U.S. legal 
mechanisms to get out of ISDS have to be workable for both of those flavors of agreement. And we heard from Ladan that there are several different international law means to an exit. Obviously, the U.S. domestic exit mechanisms need to connect to those international mechanisms. So um, to cut to the chase, because we're running a little behind time, I just want to first and foremost urge the lawyers and the policymakers listening today to please read the report, which just to underscore is available among other places at rethinktrade.org, www.rethinktrade.org, because there's a detailed legal explanation of this with lots of footnotes, but the short of it is the following. Obviously, you can get out the same way that you got in. So Congress can, just like with USMCA amending NAFTA, Congress can vote. The Senate can do the treaty version on the bits, the bicameral simple majority on the FTAs. You could literally do a vote of Congress and amend those agreements. But given the mix of executive congressional agreements and treaties, that is a very messy approach. So as we explained in the text with all those footnotes, another legitimate route would be for the executive branch to exercise what is really very broad discretion provided to the executive branch by Congress in the free trade agreements implementing bills with respect to ISDS. You will see the approach and the language on ISDS is much more open-ended with lots of discretion relative to implementation of a lot of other provisions of the FTAs. Similarly, the Supreme Court has been unwilling to outlaw executive branch treaty exits. So having the executive branch take action can work whether you do the multilateral exit or you do a one by one exit with sort of the countries of the, the, the coalition of the willing countries. And again, please dive in to read more of the details because there is actually a strong legal argument behind both of those paradigms. Um, again, the report, RethinkTrade.org, www.RethinkTrade.org. And with that, back to you, Daniel, for the question and answer. Thank you, Lori. And thank you all for the great number of questions that we have been receiving. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to pick two and we'll figure, out, we'll figure out if we are able to pick another one. The first one, and please, whoever wants to jump in, jump in and take it, go ahead, is the following one. What is more problematic, substantive legal standards found in investment agreements or the ISDL's dispute resolution mechanism? Furthermore, do the ANC-12 reform discussions provide a useful path for reform? Is there potential for tribunals like ICSID to reform, or, or is it the very premise of ISDS so fundamentally flawed that countries should exit the regime entirely? I will give the appetizer, which is yes and yes, probably not and no. <laughs> so yes, the substantive rules are a problem and they need to be changed. You see that in the USMCA with respect to the US-Mexico redo, which whacks a lot of the most open-ended regulatory takings oriented claims. And yes, the procedure is fundamentally a major problem. And that gets to the second two questions, which is uh, reforming around the margins of a system where only the investors and corporations have rights and only the governments have obligations is um, a nearly impossible circumstance. <laughs> so um, the to date, those international processes have not been enormously fruitful is how I would put it because of these structural issues. And other folks, please dive in. Let me add one thing. Um, the agreements give more protections, more rights to foreign investors than they give to domestic investors. And that asymmetry is a fundamental flaw. Uh, if we think there should be some rights, they should be for all investors, whether they're foreign or domestic. And uh, that is a, basically a, a, you know, a fundamental flaw. Uh, it is terrible. The, the, the way they're implemented uh, is you know, uh, not acceptable in the 20th or 21st century. Um, and the fact that there is no limit, the, the way the damages are calculated uh, is um, 
unacceptable, I view as unacceptable, uh, those could be reformed, but the fundamental asymmetry uh, can't be. Uh, we, we need a, a legal framework that applies to everybody. Another listener asked the question, do you think an exit in the Americas will lead to a ripple effect of wider exits around the world in Africa, Asia, etc.? Yeah, let me pick. Uh, 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 yes, I think the answer is yes. I mean, uh, a number of years ago, uh, some of the developing countries already started exit. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, had a lot of discussions with South Africa, uh, which was one of the you know uh, they they weren't able to get rid of that twenty year uh, uh, provision, but you know the clock stopped ticking. Uh, once they exited, uh, that meant that they could not be sued for new investments. And uh, so, you know, uh, even if you can't get rid of that 20 year uh, uh, succession, it's important for countries to leave as soon as they can. I think that this uh, is a perfect way to continue to for our closing remarks. So I want to thank everyone for their participation in this part of the panel. And over to you, Lori, so that we can hear from Senator Warren. So for closing remarks, Senator Warren, uh, who is the senior senator from the state of Massachusetts, a 2020 presidential candidate, a member of the Finance Committee, which covers trade issues. And during the TPP debate, she was really essential in unpacking what ISDS is and educating and making aware and alert much of the US public to the threats ISDS poses. Senator Warren. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so glad to have a chance to join you all today. So congratulations and thank you to the teams at Rethink Trade, the Georgetown University Law Center and the Columbia Law School who worked so hard to develop this report and to bring us all together for this discussion. You know, this report could not come at a more important time. Governments around the world are recognizing that the threat that ISDS poses to national sovereignty is real, the threat it poses to the environment is real, the threat it poses to workers is real, and the threat it poses to human rights is real. After decades of corporate lobbying to include ISDS in the tr United States trade agreements, I am so glad that the Biden administration is rejecting those calls and instead standing up for workers and for small businesses and for the environment. President Biden recognizes ISDS for what it is, a secretive extrajudicial arbitration system that gives corporations special privileges far beyond those of ordinary citizens or even of sovereign governments. The Biden administration has said ISDS will not be part of any of the United States future trade or investment deals. Great, but future agreements are only part of the battle. The US is still locked into many pre-existing agreements that allow corporations to weaponize ISDS as a bargaining chip when we do something that they don't like. This means any time we or our trading partners try to rein in abuses by giant corporations, all those companies have to do is file an ISDS claim for billions of dollars, then turn around and say, well, they'll drop the ISDS claim if our government will repeal its policies. A trading system that allows corporations to extort governments and actually even facilitates that extortion is just plain wrong. That's why this report is so critical. It gives us the step-by-step -step playbook on how to untangle the United States from this corporate spider web. 
You know, I fought against ISDS during the Trans-Pacific Partnership fight, and I'm going to keep on fighting until every last one of our trade agreements is ISDS free. So I am glad to have all of you as partners in this fight. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Warren. If anyone wants to view this program again or share it with others, you will find a recording at Rethink Trade's YouTube and Facebook pages, as well as the pages of the other participating groups. And please do take a look at the white paper, Turning the Tide, How to Harness the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity to Deliver an IS Free, ISDS Free Americas. Again, you can find that at RethinkTrade.org. Now, with many thanks to the white paper authors, to Professor Stiglitz and to Senator Warren, and to all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much. And please stay informed. ISDS, we can make it go away across the entire Americas. Thank you.